But now I think the Russians are finding they've been sort of locked out by their own mm. by their own preoccupation. So, Michael, Michael Binion, welcome. Um, I'm going to ask you first the sort of curious uh, question hanging in the air. Now, the Israeli military are saying they may not, may not, after all, launch a massive ground invasion of Gaza. They may do, I'm quoting now, something else. What on earth could something else be? Goodness knows. I mean, it's an extraordinary announcement. It's one that, in many ways, is extremely lucky and helpful. I mean, it shows an American achievement beyond anything anyone would have expected, if that's true. What the something else would be, who knows? It could be an intelligence uh, operation. It could be the infiltration of special forces, commando forces, who would quietly try to take out leading Hamas officials. But uh, it, whatever it is, it's going to be pretty visible. And I'm not sure there's much that the Israelis can do apart from straight military action that would really destroy the Hamas organization, which is what their aim is. Uh, it also shows that the Americans have considerable clout if that is what they have got the Israelis to agree to. And it's in to America's credit that they're willing to use pressure to try to make sure that this dreadful episode doesn't result in further bloodshed. It is a, a, a curious turn of events if, if what has happened is, is as you, you speculate. And we've got hundreds of thousands of Israeli troops on the border waiting to go in. We've got enormous amounts of Israeli armour. Are they supposed to just sit there now or will they turn back and go back to barracks? It's almost as difficult to imagine that. Well, it's very odd, yes. I mean, it would be intensely frustrating for the American, uh, for the Israeli military leadership and for the reservists who've been called up uh, and all pumped up, ready to go. I mean, probably not willingly, but uh, with a sense of mission and with a sense that now we must forever destroy Hamas, mm. which is the overriding Israeli motive. And that and, still is the mission. They mean, oh, yes. They mean to decapitate the Hamas leadership. They mean to destroy Hamas's capacity, well, to, report, to repeat what they did on October the 7th, but also to, to resume as, as in any kind of, uh, of control of Gaza or their yeah. part of Gaza. Yes, exactly. I mean, I think the military leadership knows that for full control, it would mean military occupation for years, and that would be a disaster in the long term. Uh, it happened before Israel was in military control of Gaza. They suffered enormous casualties, and it didn't really result in the pacification of Gaza at all. So I think that has been ruled out as a long-term objective. How to decapitate uh, Gaza, uh, Hamas without actually occupying the area is very difficult to foresee. And certainly the immediate uh, thing that the Israelis may avoid if they do not invade is they avoid the trap that Hamas has set for them. Because the Hamas aim all along was to force an Israeli invasion that would be so costly, so bloody, so overwhelmingly costly to civilian lives that the world would suddenly then turn away from the sympathy for the Israelis and for the terrible massacres of those innocent victims mm. slaughtered by Hamas. It would turn from that to the overriding sympathy for innocent thousands, millions of innocent civilians in Gaza who were caught in this invasion and, and perished as a result. Mm. And that is the trap that Hamas set. Now, if Israel can avoid that trap, then that is to great credit both of America and of the uh, coalition government that's now in charge in Israel, which is really facing its diff most difficult challenge almost since the birth of the state. Mm. Uh, it, it, it is still very difficult to imagine how Israel achieves its ends without a ground invasion, as, as enormously problematic as that would obviously be. And would our Palestinians, to return to their homes, while, as you say, special forces cross the border and try and seek and destroy Hamas uh, commanders or units bit by bit, while the civilian population are there? But that's not quite hard to imagine, imagine too. Very hard, very hard, yes. I think the immediate threat is that if Israel goes in with massive force and if there is huge loss of life, as almost certainly would happen, uh, then others will get involved. Hezbollah in the north uh, from Lebanon has already threatened to uh, use its forces for a full-scale incursion into Israel. Already they're firing rockets, they're terrorizing that area. Uh, and uh, the, the bigger threat is that Iran will make good on its promise to uh, in, invade or, or launch a strike of some kind if Israel goes into Gaza. Now, what Iran could do, one doesn't know, but if they get involved, 
in a full-scale military operation, then all hell breaks loose, because they're not alone. Then Russia, which thankfully, I have to say, has been kept out of this because of their own preoccupation with Ukraine. Not that that's a good reason, but the reason is that the Russians are not complicating the scene at the moment. If Iran gets involved, then Russia almost certainly would be drawn in as well. Right, so that, that then begs the question, what will Joe Biden try to do when he starts his, his work in the in the area in Israel tomorrow, um, he certainly won't want to disagree to dissent publicly with the aims and the the means, the tactics, the strategy of, of Israel. That's for sure. Yes, I think Biden's strategy, which is a very smart one, is hold Israel close in order to be able to influence your friend. Uh, if he doesn't come out clearly, openly, and supportively uh, helping Israel to overcome this moment of tragedy and crisis, then the Israelis, frankly, will not listen either to America or to any UN resolution or to anybody else. They'll just do what they feel they have to do for their own survival. Now, if it's clear that Biden, at huge cost, has come over on a special flying visit, uh, remember, he's, he's 80, he's aging, he's not uh, really a person of robust stamina, but he's willing to get involved uh, if not he personally, then certainly his very capable Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, are ready to put their prestige and their entire administration on the line to try to defuse this crisis. And I think the Israelis are going to be hugely appreciative of the fact that he's come there in person to do this and are willing, therefore, probably, to listen to some of the things he might be telling them. Mm. You think the groundwork for this meeting, the sort of heads of agreement, that would have been thrashed out before Joe Biden even lands? Well, I hope so, because he's not only going to be talking to the Israelis, but in uh, a move that I think is very thoughtful and balanced, he's going across to the other side. He's meeting King Abdullah of Jordan, he's meeting the head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, and he's also meeting President Sisi of Egypt. And that's an important meeting, because one of the things that the Americans are very keen to do is to get the Egyptians to open that border mm. and let out some of these people desperate to seek safety. And the, the message to Iran will be the familiar one. Don't even think about it. We've got exactly. two, two American battle groups there in the region, the president turning up in, in person. A lot of that is about warning off the likes of Iran or anyone else who might choose to uh, get involved. Very sensible, yes. And it might work. I mean, if there is no immediate pretext for the, Israeli, uh, the Iranians to say we're coming to help the Palestinians and save our brethren... Uh, then it's much more difficult for them actually to, to launch some kind of military action. Mm. And I think however fanatical the Supreme Leader and his acolytes in uh, the Iranian government are, the fact is that um, realism will, will be forced on mm. them, and I think they wouldn't launch an attack if there is no obvious excuse to do so. Yeah, but well, so far we've discussed a lot of problems without a solution, and here's, a, <laughs> here's another one. How do you fill the vacuum left behind by Hamas when and if they are thrown down? Who would fulfill that role? Who could? Very difficult, yes. I think a lot of people in Gaza are themselves probably disillusioned with the uh, years of Hamas government, which have not really brought them any relief, any uh, economic advance, any chance to get out of this vast prison that is Gaza, this tiny strip with 2.3 million people hemmed in, unable to get out. Uh, Israel thought that things were getting better by allowing more people to go across and work in Israel, to allow a little bit more access, to allow more goods in and out. In other words, to try to normalize Gaza. But Hamas had its other plans. And I think a lot of people in Gaza might be thinking, if it wasn't for Hamas, you know, things might have got better. Now, mm. how we go back to where we were without the trust is very difficult. I can't. Mm. It's going to take years to rebuild any trust. And I don't think anyone now is going to turn on Hamas and blame them for what's happened. They're going to be saluting them for attempting to liberate Gaza, uh, even if it resulted in terrible tragedy. Mm. So Joe Biden's argued against a, any kind of prolonged Israeli occupation. It is difficult to see, isn't it, to see uh, the, the, the Palestinians of Gaza accepting, say, the Palestinian National Authority and Mahmoud Abbas stepping in. They already see uh, the PNA with a lot of suspicion. And in these circumstances, one imagine even more. Are we talking about the UN? Again, these are questions without a clear answer. 
Yes, I mean, the idea of a UN administration is a sort of attractive idea, but, I mean, frankly, it wouldn't really work. I mean, the UN is not a powerful organisation at the moment. It's stymied because it's paralysed because of the Russian veto over almost everything that the UN might attempt, and by meddling with other people with interests in the region. So, uh, although it sounds a possible solution, a UN interim administration... I don't think that would work very well. Um, the other problem, of course, is that Gaza's immediate neighbour, Egypt, is fundamentally opposed to Hamas. And Egypt is making no effort whatsoever to help their fellow Arab brethren across the border. They don't want to let them in. They have a terrified vision of millions, of, well, thousands, certainly, of people from Gaza flooding into Sinai and of Hamas spreading its influence into Sinai and into Egypt generally. Well, that's not what they want at all. So they're keeping that border firmly shut. Russia has not stepped into this. It hasn't spoken in any significant way about the, this, this crisis. Where does Russia sit in this picture? Very difficult for the Russians at the moment. They are uh, preoccupied with what's uh, going on in Ukraine. Uh, they're obviously deeply engaged there. They haven't got forces to spare or even really much attention to spare for the Middle East. They are allied with Syria. They're allied with the Palestinians in a kind of general ideological sense, but not to the point of coming to their aid. And they are, in fact, not really in the picture anymore at all. They've had to be, um, they've had to withdraw themselves because of their other preoccupations. They're isolated. Nobody's really going to seek Russian help or Russian support. And so I think the Russians are being put in a rather difficult position on this. They've left the field clear for the Americans to return to an area that used to be very much dominated by uh, the American power and American influence uh, until the Americans themselves got tired of the Middle East and sort of withdrew gradually, withdrew their interest and in their. Uh, interests and left the field fairly open for the Russians, who until about three or four years ago were the main power in the region. But now I think the Russians are finding they've been sort of l locked out by their own mm. by their own preoccupations. Although one imagines Russia would be quite happy to see a, a full blown conflict in the in the region as a distraction from what is happening in Europe and Ukraine, and maybe as an alternative draw for, for supplies and weapons which are currently heading towards Ukraine. Well, that's very possible. I mean, that's an interesting line of thought, and I mean, I hope that that thought hasn't occurred to the Kremlin. <laughs> well, <laughs> they would certainly revel in the difficulties that are taking place. They, pro they probably would, yes. It would certainly distract attention from their own difficulties in Ukraine.